Tell me how it feels to be presenting this award, Modern Master, to Bruce Stern tonight. It's my honor. I've known Bruce for longer than I care to tell. We've been in three films together, and it's like family to me because I'm such good friends with Laura. And here's the man of the hour right now. <laughs> Always a gentleman. I adore you. Um, he's offering me his coat. He's so sweet. It's a little chilly here tonight. Um, but anyway, of course, it is just a wonderful thing to be able to participate in sharing the love that we all feel for Bruce Stern and his fine work over five decades. What does he like to work with? You know, he's such a consummate professional. He's, he's whatever you need him to be that day. And I'm sure it may not always be that way, but maybe I'm just lucky. <laughs> he, you know, he's, he knows what it takes and he's willing to do whatever it takes you know and if that means a lot of takes or if that means you only get one take uh, he'll always be ready well, hopefully we'll see you guys work together again thank you thank you so much Diane it's my pleasure enjoy this evening I'm sure I will thank you Bruce tell me how it feels to be named a modern master at the Santa Barbara Film Festival uh, well it feels fabulous anytime anybody calls you a master um, it's amazing. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm shocked and thrilled that people think of that, uh, particularly a place like this, you know. Um, I remember one of the neat things I did in my running career, because I run all the time, is I had a friend, that, several friends that lived here that were runners with us. They all belonged to Santa Barbara Athletic Club in the 60s and 70s. Uh, John Brennan, Bob Carmen, um, Jim Van Manen. Uh, and uh, one Sunday when I knew that I was strong enough to do it, I ran from my house in Malibu to Bob Carmen's house in Goleta, 89 miles. And he, he joined me at the halfway and turned around and ran back with me. No, Santa Barbara was big stuff. So anytime the folks here get together to do anything and want to say a shout out to me, I'm thrilled about it. You know? well, we're, couldn't be more thrilled to oh, have you here. You. you have a in wonderful face. Oh, thank you. Coming from you, you don't have people at home to tell you that? Then get new people. Not enough, Bruce. Not uh, enough. Oh, well, get it. At this, add, or add one. At this point in your iconic career, what, gra what makes you gravitate towards a certain character? Did you fall in love with Woody when you read him on the page? Uh, you don't fall in love with characters. You realize the challenge is to become who they are and what they stand for. And that was the challenge with Woody. One thing about that part of America I've always felt is all of the men and women in that area and that whole heartland part of America, that's not just Nebraska, that's like nine or ten states. There's one thing they all have, they're fair. And that was something I wanted to make sure that we got said in the movie. There's a sense of fairness everywhere. Um, and how they deal with each other, especially inside the family, is a whole different story. But they're always kind of fair to each other. Well, Woody is certainly so quirky. How much of Bruce is in there? Eighty percent. All right. You know, I mean, Bruce has game, and so does Woody. And That's maybe he gets just a little more than you think he gets. <laughs> he said, "You're not a leading man. You never will be. You have a face like a forceps baby." And <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, you're going to go out there and you're going to be the third cowboy from the right in all, all the westerns that they do. And oddly enough, my first year in Hollywood, this will, you know, shake the troops a tad, Universal Pictures alone did 14 hours of westerns on television every week. So if you could get on that lot, and Nicholson, Harry Dean Stanton, and I found our way through the secretaries to get on that lot every way we could. <laughs> and uh, we'd play little two and three line parts and everything, you know. But Dad told me at the end, and he said, you're going to be the third cowboy from the right. And Lee leaned forward, and he said, you just make sure, with the post-nasal drip, you, you just make sure that you're the most interesting goddamn third cowboy anybody ever saw. <laughs> And so 
I think I always knew it would be a long haul. Uh, one day on the set, Alexander Payne said to me, I don't know, the, the first day, he said to me, you see anything on the set today you've never seen before? I said, Nebraska. Uh, <laughs> he said, uh, aside from that. I said, well, it seems at 8 o'clock in the morning, um, everybody's pulling their oar. And that surprises me on the first day. He said, well, hopefully that's because I have 87 crew members here and 49 of them have worked every day on every film I've ever made. So I realized there was a family there. Mm -hmm. And I realized I was protected. Mm -hmm. And I realized I had to take risk every single take, not just scenes, but take, mm -hmm. because you're supported. And then he said to me, don't show Faden, Papa, Michael, and I, he was a camera cinematographer, anything. And I'm not sure you've ever done anything like this in your whole career. Let us do our jobs. Don't show us anything. Let us find it. And that was the sentence that made me realize not only did I have the part of a lifetime, but I had an opportunity to do something I've worked all my career for, and that is to put as many consecutive, moment-to-moment, -moment, honest moments together in a movie, scene after scene, take after take. And he does that for everybody he works with. I mean, you look at all six of his movies, there's performances, people come up to levels they haven't been at before, they surprise themselves even. I mean, Will Forte, if he was out here now, he'd still tell you, he, he, he doesn't have any idea how he was in the movie. <laughs> he knows he's not in it because we all saw MacGruber, I can tell you that. <laughs> Charlton Heston once told me, an actor is only as good as his next film. And I sit here with as good a film as I've ever been in, in Nebraska. And you saw some other good ones that I was in. But Nebraska may be it uh, at this point in my career. But the excitement for me is not will I win anything else. I won it when the guy gave me the goddamn role. Let's face it, I mean, that's the biggest win of my career. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I think the thing that is most gratifying is I'm excited now because I don't know who's out there or who's out there in the whole world of the cinema. I'm excited to see how they see me next, what they might ask me to do that nobody seems to have asked me before. Because unlike a couple of months ago, there have been a couple phone calls in the last three or four weeks. And uh, that's very gratifying because uh, after can, I turned to Alexander and I said, this is great. He says, you're on your way. I said, hey, bud, I'd just give anything for two days on a CSI. <laughs> Every single performance that Bruce Stern has given to us so far is exactly what we've come to expect of him. A revelation, and you say it best, as if stolen from himself, betraying himself giving away more than he seemed to intend, surprising himself as much as us. Bruce's characters are more about the questions that they raise than the answers we've come to expect from a performance. No matter how much screen time he occupies, his craft has engaged us for over five decades. Yes, five decades. Five plus decades. He's embroidered all these wonderful tapestries of his characters and his commanding performances. I mean, you are the dude that shot John Wayne in the Cowboys. <laughs> I got to see it finally. I, I mean, it's legendary, but there it is, and here you are, and I'm pinching myself. And this amazing opportunity to revisit your work in Coming Home, which changed my life to witness performances like that from you and Jane and John, and it's just timeless. And of course, that's what got you nominated for your first Oscar nomination, Best Supporting Actor. It still resonates. And you went on to go head to head with Robert Redford and The Great Gatsby, Jack and The King of Marvin Gardens. 
and a long line of amazing directors, of course, including Hal Ashby and Alfred Hitchcock, Walter Hill. I've worked with you three times. Sidney Pollack, Quentin Tarantino. You've touched so many lives. You are one of those great connectors. Cowboys, killers, lovers, fighters, husbands, brothers, highbrows, low lifes. You've done it all, but not all yet. There is something about your work in Nebraska, Woody Grant. It was your stillness. What courage it takes an actor to remain so still that you let us in to feel what is being felt instead of explaining things with any grandiosity. You do that very well, of course. Your work in Nebraska has already won Best Actor at the Cannes Film Festival, the National Board of Review, the Los Angeles Film Critics, and of course, you're nominated now for your second Oscar in the lead category this time. Many critics have called it the performance of your life, but something tells me that we have a whole lot to hear more from you, Verstern, and it's my great honor and pleasure to present you with the Modern Master Award. True legend that you are, Mr. Bruce Dern. And I remember the first day I worked with Mr. Hitchcock, I asked him, I said, when did you first realize that uh, the cinema or movies uh, were what it's all about? And he said, uh, Bruce, I looked above the marquee at the Tivoli where I lived in London, and you know what it said? The same thing it says now. I said, what's that, sir? Moving pictures. <laughs> and I never forgot it, because he was saying moving pictures, and I was saying give me the opportunity to be in moving pictures. And that's what I've tried to do my whole career. Be in pictures that are about people that are doing things in time of crisis and making the decisions that they make. So in my career, I've been very blessed because I fell into the laps of a lot of directors who made movies like that. And we've talked about several of them tonight. And when you get somebody like Alexander Payne, or a Quentin, or a Mr. Kazan, or I'm going to leave names out, but Francis Coppola, and Bob Rafelson, and Hal Ashby, and Michael Ritchie, and all the others I've worked with, Jack Nicholson, um, and Mr. Hitchcock, and on and on. Um, for the most part, they're interested in the human condition. And the best way I can sum it up is about what my career is about, it wasn't my original statement. Um, but we made a documentary a few years ago called A Decade Under the Influence, was about the movies of the 70s and uh, how lucky we were to be come along at that time because it seemed the industry got a little tired of the conventional leading man kind of movie and started making movies about men and women who are a little more on the edge and a little more out there. And we were lucky because we were the guys on the playground when they started making those movies, so we got chosen. And uh, what made it wonderful was, at the end of this documentary, Marty Scorsese comes out. There were four actors, four directors, four writers that talked about the films of the 70s, Marty being one of them. And at the end of it all, summing it up, he says, you know, I'm absolutely blown away by the wizardry and the technology of the way they make movies today and their propensity to make money fast, meaning 100 million in a weekend. He said, I don't think I'd ever know how to make a film like that or could do a film like that. I don't know, it just blows me away, the genius of it all. 
And yet at the end of the day, with all that spectacular stuff on film and all the wonderful things they're able to do, I miss the people. Well, my career is about trying to find people that you guys will be interested in sitting through an hour and 45 minutes watching what they, what they do. So thank you all very much for this. <laughs>